A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter proceeded to speak, saying, In truth, I see that God shows no partiality. Rather, in every nation, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. You know the word that he sent to the children of Israel as he proclaimed peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. What has happened over all Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. This man God raised on the third day and granted that he be visible, not to all the people, but to us, the witnesses chosen by God in advance, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commissioned us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Verbum Domini. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we also await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will change our lowly body to conform with his glorified body by the power that enables him also to bring all things into subjection to himself. 
Verbum Domini. Dominus vobiscum, et vos spiritus tuum, lesio sancti evangelii secundum Ionum, gloria in nomine. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God, have faith also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am you also may be. Where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Master, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verbum Domini, In sacred scripture, there are a few places where we find summaries of the Holy Gospel. For example, if you were to read chapters 5 through 7 of St. Matthew's Gospel, you would find the Sermon on the Mount, which, as we know, is a summary of the Gospel message. And it just so happens that in today's first reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapters 34 to 43, chapter 10, we have St. Peter's homily. St. Peter's homily is actually a summary of St. Mark's Gospel. If you were to compare what you find in St. Mark's Gospel to this homily, you would find an outline, a summary of that particular Gospel. And it makes sense because we know that St. Mark's Gospel, uh, much of the content was taken from St. Peter himself. So it only makes sense. So we, here we find uh, this summary of the gospel. Now, it begins with St. John the Baptist and uh, about his ministry and the baptism of Jesus, and it ends, as does St. Mark's gospel, with the Great Commission. The Great Commission, that is, given to the church through the apostles to go out into the entire world and to evangelize everyone, every time, every place. And all of us not only the apostles, that didn't end, up, end with them, but all of us have a non-optional, non-optional part to play in the Great Commission. God has given each one of us a particular role and a task in this Great Commission during this time and in whatever place you find yourself. And none of us can opt out of that. 
whether it be in prayer and laying in a bed, helpless, or whether it be a young, robust person running around and evangelizing, um, all of us have a part to play. And God calls each of us to uh, fulfill a particular responsibility, a particular role in that Great Commission. And none of us, none of us is non-optional in that, is that God created all of us for a particular purpose in that Great Commission. All of us have a duty, and if we don't fulfill it, it could mean the loss of a soul to the evil one. All of us have a part to play. And all of us have been given that role by God, and we've been given the grace to fulfill that role. We're not helpless. God is with us. And the fruit is dependent on our response. We can be given great tasks to do by God, great works of evangelization, but if we're not responsive, nothing's going to happen, and we're responsible for the wasting of those graces. Some of us are called not to hardly do anything as far as action goes, but God has given us a grace to do something, even if that's just prayer and offering up our suffering. Now, most of us are called the little things. We're not called the great works of evangelization. We're not called to do all these uh, magnanimous things that we've seen the saints do throughout the centuries, through the course of history. Most of us are called to be little people, but we're all called to to do our little thing, and you know, If we do that and we're faithful, we can become great saints, even greater saints than those who do awesome things and create awesome works. And so there are, though, a few of us that are called by God to do great works, exterior works, works of evangelization, uh, works of founding institutes, other various works. And if the response is generous, great things will happen. So you can always judge a tree by its fruit. What is the fruit that comes from that? And so if you have great works that have been done, perhaps through an instrument, a person as an instrument of God to proclaim the gospel, if if that bears abundant fruit, you know you got a good tree. You know you got someone that's responding to God's grace, someone that's trying, someone that's willing. Now that person isn't perfect, still a human being, still a sinner, Nonetheless, the response is what is necessary. And so those that are called to do great things, though, need us, little people, to carry out their great works. We're not indispensable. So, for example, um, uh, look at the network itself, EWTN. Now, Mother Angelica and a handful of sisters by themselves without nobody's help could not do what has been done. They needed everybody's help. And that required also the help of many people who uh, received God's grace. Uh, God was able to work through the message they received from EWTN, but through really his grace, not the message itself, but through God's grace, perhaps to help them in their spiritual life, grant them a conversion, whatever it may be. But God needed us little people to help support this big work. And so all of us, uh, all of you who've, who've helped spiritually through your suffering, through your prayers, and even uh, monetarily or uh, donating gifts, you've helped this cause. And you played perhaps a part that God asked you to do in the salvation of the world. It's true. It really exists. It's, it's the real thing. And remember that those that are called to do great works, they're not called to do these great works for themselves. Mother Angelica didn't need EWTN for herself. But God needed her to respond to his grace to establish EWTN for numerous people, millions of people. You would not believe the emails that are coming in, the messages from all over the world from every corner, literally every corner of the, of the planet, every continent, multiple countries of people that have been affected in places you wouldn't imagine, like in the backwoods of Siberia and Russia. Who would think? But yet the message made it there, and all of us helped Mother Angelica with that, with our prayers, our sufferings, and any support otherwise we could give. Now, Most of us would dream that we could be one of those persons that receives these great missions and doing these great things. But if we ever saw the price tag 
that comes with that, we would say, somebody else could have this job. These great works don't come without an incredible price tag. And very few people are willing to suffer and to go through what is needed to pay that price. Most of us, God hasn't called to do that. He's called us to do other things. But sometimes he calls some people, the most generous ones, with his grace to do these great works. And God also, as we know, chooses the most unlikely people, the people that we would not choose. We would choose these other people because of some human characteristic they have. But God looks into the heart and he chooses those who he knows will be generous and he can use as his instrument, those who are available. So we have founders of, re of religious orders, or founders of religious orders. A lot of times the people you'd least likely expect to do great works. But they were very generous and God was able to work through them. And the price tag is heavy. For example, there's one saying, I can't think of her name right now, uh, French, 19th century. God called her to found a religious institute. She founded it, paid an incredible price tag to found this. And that's one of the reasons why the church allows that to count as one of the miracles, in some cases, uh, for canonization. To start a religious community is, is a miracle. <laughs> and everybody knows that. Every religious who's ever gone through that knows that. But this religious woman founded this order and was the mother abbess or the mother prioress for all these years. And at the end of, the, at the end of her life, she tried to step down. Her community turned on her and actually kicked her out of the com religious community she founded. But she remained faithful and humble. That is a huge price tag to pay. Most of us would be bitter. And yet God was able to, through that, raise her to great heights of sanctity. Another, another example, a confessor. How many do we know? A couple of real famous ones, St. Padre Pio, St. John Vianney, and by the way, if I'm not mistaken, I remember our Wednesday audiences with Mother Angelica, and she would tell us that one of her favorite saints, if not her favorite saint, was St. John Vianney. This man who was a hound for souls, after souls, and she would read his biography every year. And I remember going down to these Wednesday audiences, as we called them, with Mother Angelica during the formative years of our community, and there she'd be having her this big, thick book on the biography of St. John Vianney. And there are others who are called the great works of the apostolate, and there are numerous. Now, we don't know if she's a saint or not. We're not sure if she's in heaven or not. But Mother Angelica is one of those persons that has been called to great works of evangelization and paid an incredible hefty price tag for that. Now only the Pope in an official capacity can infallibly declare whether a person is in heaven or not. No one else under any circumstance can do that, no matter what. We don't have the certitude. We could be dead wrong. Even if it's an unofficial statement, it's not official. Unofficial means non-official. So we have to wait for that through the apostolic authority that the Pope has. Perhaps it will come, perhaps it won't. Now, talking about a hefty price tag to pay for the works of this apostolate, I just give you one example, and many people don't know of this situation, and um, sometimes I, I keep it guarded to myself, but as you know, in the hospital, Christmas Eve 2001, Mother Angelica suffered this massive stroke. Now, for whatever reason, I was just a little seminarian, and I got called to go with the priest to the hospital, Father Joseph, everybody knows, to be there with Mother Angelica during this time of crisis, during her stroke. And so I remember very vividly, you're standing there, you're just kind of like a flower pot, you carry the luggage, open the doors, and you're this there as a little, a little seminarian, a little twerp, and uh, the doctor comes out and says, Mother Angelica has hemorrhaging on the brain, it's massive hemorrhaging. We're going to perform surgery, but the surgery has never been successful in the history of medicine, and she has a 97% chance of dying. So we're, we're there going, okay, this is it. This is the big time. This is 2001 Christmas Eve. 
So I'm just this little twerp here trying to figure, process all of this. I don't even know what to do or even what to think. But she pulled through. She pulled through. And after the surgery, we all went up to the hospital room, and here's Mother Angelica. Almost her entire head was bandaged with, with all of this gauze and tape, and tubes were coming out of everywhere. And you just thought to yourself, boy, this is it. How can anybody survive this? She just had brain surgery, of all things. And then all of a sudden, I'm, I'm standing there, and I find myself alone. Everybody else left. And I'm in the room with Mother Angelica that very night, and I'm standing at her side. I don't know what to say. I, what do you do? <laughs> you pray, you hold her hand maybe, talk to her. Um, but it, it was a great grace to be there, and I never thought she would, she would walk again or if she'd probably be bedridden. But then about three or four years later, as a follow-up price tag, if I may add, three or four years later, um, well, first of all, um, Mother Angelica was determined to evangelize no matter what the cost and no matter what she was suffering or going through. She was determined to evangelize in one way or another. It didn't matter. Jesus. If you recall, in 1999, the Pope released a document called Ecclesia in Asia, which was a part of a series of Ecclesia Inns, as they're called, America, Oceania, Asia, and so forth. And in there, he said, as he's writing to the people of the Orient, during the first Christian, Christian millennium, the cross was planted in Europe. In the second Christian millennium, that cross was planted in the Americas and Africa. And it is in the third Christian millennium that the cross is going to be planted in Asia, in the Orient. It's going to be the evangelization of the East. And that's what God is calling us to. Now, Mother Angelica wasn't done after that surgery. Things had only begun. And of course, she suffered in that bed with the after effects for 15 years. Now, it just so happened about three or four years later after the stroke, Mother Angelica was determined to go to the Orient and start evangelizing to the East. And guess what she did? She went there. She actually f flew to Japan, spent three weeks there to try to restart a poor Clare monastery that had fallen, um, a number of sisters had left, and so it needed to kind of be revived or rebuilt. So Mother Angelica, she ends up flying to the Orient. Now, she can't talk, she can't walk, she has incredible back pain, and here we are, once again, the little twerp got selected to go with the priest to be along just to observe, carry the luggage, open the doors, and that kind of thing. And uh, here we are, we're on the plane. Now, if you've ever been in turbulence in a small jet, you know that it can be quite up and down. It's not like a big 747 that's got stability in it. There's some messing around there, some turbulence, but not huge. So imagine Mother Angelica in a wheelchair in this jet, incredible back pain, and every time there's turbulence, a shot of pain goes up her back. She can't say anything. She can't walk. But she was determined to go to the Orient to evangelize after all of this. After all of this. So here we are. We're flying in this jet. We're heading on the, our way to Japan. And it became very interesting. Uh, if you've ever offered mass uh, in the air or in space, at, we're at 60,000 feet. We're getting ready to cross the international date line. And we're not sure which bishop's name we should use because we don't know what diocese we're actually in. <laughs> and beyond that, we don't even know what day it is. Are we supposed to take the mass for tomorrow or yesterday? Uh, so what do you do? What bishop do you use? But here we are, 60,000 feet, I hope this is legal, offering mass for the sisters, for Mother Angelica in this plane. Now talk about an incredible experience and the determination that someone has responded to God's grace in this capacity. But guess what? We're all called to do the same thing, in whatever capacity that is. So here we're going. Now, if you can imagine, we were traveling with two medical doctors, a nurse, a couple of friars, a couple of sisters that had, had to take care of Mother Angelica's medical needs. We're traveling with an FBI agent or an ex-FBI agent because Mother needed an, 
needed security at that time. This is post 9-11. So if you can imagine arriving into one of Japan's international airports and you got this Secret Service dude running around with a bunch of nuns and, and habits in Japan and we don't have to go through any security checkpoints. If you've got an FBI agent, you're pretty clear. So here we are just zipping through security. This is post 9-11. And all these people are going, what in the world is this going by me? We got this situation going on. These people must have just been, didn't know what to do. What, who, what's going on here, running through security like this, dressed like that? Just shows the determination that Mother Angelica had uh, to found and to go to the East. Now, it is my opinion only it is my opinion only that Mother Angelica was ahead of her time in many areas, in many areas, and one of those was going to evangelize the East. A lot of times Pope John Paul II would say it, put it in a document, and Mother Angelica a short time later would follow up on that and be right on the cutting edge to go right into there. So here she is, she goes in, and perhaps this is where EWTN will evangelize, begin to turn as the church herself turns to evangelize the East. The bottom line, be faithful to what God calls you to. Be faithful to what God calls you to do in your life. That includes me too. Be faithful. Become a great saint. And as she always said, don't miss the opportunity.